Hi, folks. Here we are again. This is an important day, important lecture. Uh, today, I want to talk you through the examination procedure. Now, you may remember that we have a formality check overcome, and it is now landed. Our file has been landed with the examiner. Now, the examiner has, is in charge to look for absolute grounds. If he finds there's a likelihood of absolute grounds uh, fulfilled, then it should raise an objection letter. If he doesn't find anything, if he thinks it's okay with absolute grounds, he just sent the letter through the system. Everything is electronically uh, linked within EIPO. He sent it to a publication. So uh, everything is okay. Publication is for opposition purposes, right? So if he finds there is something on the absolute grounds, and here is uh, the absolute grounds for recalling, you know this already, Article 7, Paragraph 1, Trademark Regulation, all the absolute grounds are outlined there. Okay, so uh, admitting he uh, found something on the absolute grounds, so he raised an, an objection letter. The objection letter uh, has been uh, has to be sent to the applicant or to the lawyer in that case, and setting, so to say, the stage. The objection letter has to raise the ground and the justification why this ground is likely to be fulfilled in the present case, so that the applicant or the lawyer they could assess what to submit as argument against the allegation of the examiner, right? So the objection letter is being sent out to the applicant. If the applicant is outside of the European Union, he has two months in order to submit its allegations and afterwards a decision is taken. So the objection letter is very important and it is an important issue in judicial uh, terms in Europe because it is the, um, uh, the expression of the right to be heard or the right of defense. Now the objection letter is being uh, sent out, uh, then the, uh, the applicant has the choice to withdraw the application if it sees, well, there's no uh, chance, uh, the examiner's right, he can withdraw, but without being reimbursed, right? Or uh, he can submit its allegations. And if it is the non-distinctiveness or the uh, descriptiveness, uh, which is in, in, uh, uh, in question here, then it would be that it has the possibility of overcoming this objection by uh, presenting evidence that it has been used over time. Okay, so this is uh, the introduction. I want come now to a decision. A decision, I won't walk you through a real decision from EU IPO, so that once you have seen it, well, you know what is inside. You will learn a lot from uh, this decision in today's lecture. And here is the decision. So you see it is a decision from the, uh, the, for the trademark Unica. It has been applied for as a figurative mark. It could have been also applied for as a word mark. As you can see, it is only letters. So what is the difference here? Well, a figurative mark is only protected in its filed representation, whereas a word mark is protected in the font style in upper and lower case letters. The application is from a company from Taipei, so probably uh, English has been chosen as the first language of filing. In fact, most of the cases have English as a first or second language. Uh, the Taipei company chose a lawyer in France, as you can see, to represent it. The file number is 18 million something, right? It is there on the top. So it is a direct filing. You can see this from the numbering. It would be in international registration through the Madrid system if it would start with a W at the beginning. Now, as to the corpse of the decision, the decision total is three pages only, right? So it has uh, three parts. Any 
decision from the examiner, they could uh, be distinguished in three parts. And I will walk you through these three parts. So you can see from the first part, there is the trademark and the goods uh, and services, if any, uh, which are uh, referenced in the objection letter, uh, setting, uh, so to say, the stage. In this case, the examiner took provisionally the view that the Swedish-speaking consumers would understand the mark as a laudatory term in the sense of unique, as it means in uh, Sweden, right? Uh, you know already from previous lectures that there's a unitary character. Uh, so if in one part, one significant part of the European uh, Union, this has fulfills an objection ground, then it can't be qualified for the whole European Union. So it can't be qualified as a, a European Union trademark. So you know already from previous video that the applicant is faced with these uh, three choices. He can uh, withdraw or submit allegations or the evidence uh, in, any, in this case for Sweden uh, it can be overcome with uh, evidence that it has been used, uh, a kind of market survey or so. Uh, and the, here you can see that the applicant or the lawyer chose the second option to submit uh, its allegations. Now the second part of the decision is the repetition of the applicant's arguments, right? The first argument uh, here on the down part uh, the mark has a figurative element, a small letter I in the middle, uh, which makes it distinctive. Uh, so I would say there's a very weak argument, it's barely visible, the middle uh, I. It has uh, no influence on the, uh, on, on the word, on the meaning of the word, and it is... Um, you know, you see this as unica and that's it. So uh, they would not take any uh, notice of the middle letter. Now, the second argument would be the consumer uh, sees the sign and, prod and products together with the, with the good itself. Uh, and this has some influence on the level of perception uh, as the goods are technical. So this is also a very weak argument. So a trademark can be placed on the goods, right? Uh, but it can be placed also on a package, or it can be placed on, on, uh, on a tag, uh, it can be placed on ads or, or wherever. Uh, so it is not limited, uh, the, um, the uh, marking of the product with the trademark. But in any case, also on the trademark, if it is very much uh, placed, it can be uh, perceived as a laudatory term. Now I'm coming to the second page. <clears throat> there is um, the third argument. The goods have been sold in countries in the EU which are not subject to the objection. So in other countries, Germany. So what the heck, you would say. Uh, it is uh, completely a stupid and irrelevant argument uh, to look at uh, countries where the objection is not uh, being raised for. The fourth, the fourth argument, uh, the applicant has no intention to use the mark in a monopolistic way. Well, uh, the intention uh, is not part of the registration, right? You can have whatever intention it is. Uh, it may be licit or illicit, but the intention is not being judged by the examiner. It can't be judged by the examiner because it is interior to the applicant. It is not about intention here. It is about the uh, perception of the consumers, in that case, the Swedish consumers. Now, the last one, uh, this, uh, the uh, uh, EU IPO has already registered uh, trademarks, Unica, for, uh, for other applicants and for other goods and services. So it should also be uh, uh, acceptable for EU IPO in the present case. So uh, this is a uh, argument which is most cited from applicants and it is probably also one of the most worthless arguments. 
the uh, court has already uh, judged and again and again on this argument and it has said well uh, other case is another case so uh, each case is to be judged on its own merits and you cannot compare one case with other goods and uh, other consumers or, or whatever the uh, problem it might be uh, with the present case. Also, uh, there exists a possibility that EU IPO was wrong in registering one uh, Unicar trademark for certain marks because here the, uh, the examiner took a different vision. But if the examiner is right, uh, and uh, the court uh, would say uh, he, is, he, he may be right in that case, then uh, it cannot be said, well, uh, there was a wrong case, so this should be wrongly uh, judged as well. So that, that obviously cannot be. Now, uh, it is, uh, the, uh, the lawyer must know this, so this might be an argument that uh, the lawyers raise in order to impress the client but it will certainly not impress the examiner. Now, then you have the third part of the decision, which is the final reasoning of the examiner. You see on the downside of this page, the citation of uh, judgments of the general court. There's uh, C311 uh, C slash 11, uh, that is a, a ruling from 12th of uh, July 2012, right? The examiner indicates the paragraph 48 of that ruling which he is citing. So you can easily find the judgment and the corresponding paragraph in the eSearch case law database, uh, which is on the EU IPO website, and verify the citation whether it's okay or not. And uh, you can do this with any uh, citation from the examiner. You can do this very easily. Now I'm coming to the third page now. Uh, I, uh, I gave you already uh, clues on the quality of arguments raised by the applicant. So it is now here uh, that the examiner uh, goes on to, uh, in this case, uh, reject one after the other of the arguments. So uh, the arguments are nothing to be impressed of. No wonder that the examiner has refused, on my opinion, the trademark to proceed to publication. The, uh, 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 the rejection is all just confirmed. The objection letter is just confirmed through the refusal letter, right? Now, at the end of the decision, uh, you find how to appeal against uh, this decision. And uh, here, uh, you can uh, appeal to the uh, boards of appeal, right? That is the, the possibility you can do. I would not recommend if that was my client, it was my case here, uh, I would not recommend to appeal against the decision because you have no real arguments. You can probably uh, argue that the Swedish consumer understand this is a trademark if you have a market survey, if you have sufficient evidence to say, well, uh, we have marketed this on the Swedish market over a long time and uh, this is a market survey which says that the consumer uh, perceive Unica as a uh, trademark, uh, not as a laudatory term. And if you present this to the examiner, then it would be possible that the examiner uh, review his initial position in the rejection letter and let the uh, application proceed to uh, opposition. But it is also possible that the examiner reconsiders its initial rejection letter, issues another, ob uh, sorry, objection letter, issues another objection letter in order to uh, raise the uh, non-distinctiveness with regard to, I don't know, the Spanish public, probably unique, unica, uh, that uh, could be by the Spanish consumer also perceived as something um, uh, non-distinctive. So, that's it, what I wanted to, uh, to tell you. So 
uh, hopefully you, I'm, I'm very proud of this one. I think uh, you should, you should know how to, how to, uh, how these uh, decisions are being taken, and the next one will be on the, uh, on the opposition.